All right, guys, welcome back to the second half of the lecture on section 1.4, talking about the Americas. Last time we spent some time talking about the Aztecs in Central America. Today, what we're going to do is talk about their partners in South America, the Incas, and kind of the great civilization that they were able to build. We're also going to be talking a little bit about the Polynesians as well as they expanded out into the Pacific Ocean. So let's talk about the Incas. They were the largest empire in the pre-Columbian Americas. Without the wheel, they didn't have a written language or even any money at all. So this civilization completely developed on its own. So the question is, what is an Inca? So an Inca, as they refer to themselves as Tawantinsu, named themselves the land of the four quarters. The land of the four quarters quarters is what their the word came from. They included modern day parts of Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. They had a population of more than 10 million people across many different ethnic groups and languages. Their culture developed in total isolation, so they were missing a lot of the vital components of what we considered of the old world, such as China and Europe and Asia and Africa. The wheel was absent um, as well as any as well as any animal capable of pulling weight, such as the horse, steel and iron, which were vital for tools, were unknown. But gold, silver, and bronze were worked on masterfully by the Incas. They did not have a written language, so all the knowledge that we have of them was either passed on by the Spanish or was passed on orally. They did, however, use an in an interesting method known as huipu, which was a system of beads and strings that they would string together to make certain patterns to be able to communicate and relay messages. There's no one left that knows how to read huipu, so we don't really know, even though we have these beads, we don't know what they say. This ancient language has not been figured out. Let's take a look at the origins of the Inca people and figure out kind of who they were. So ancient Peru is kind of considered to be one of these uh, cradles of civilizations, kind of along with Egypt and Mesopotamia and China and India. Between 8,000 and 3,000 BC, the people domesticated llamas and alpacas and grew crops such as potatoes and corn, beans, peanuts, squash, quinoa, cocoa, a lot of variety. Because they were so high up in elevation, much of this farming was done at the minimum of 10,000 feet above sea level. Nowhere else have so many people lived for so long in such difficult circumstances. But the Inca didn't only just survive. They built one of the largest empires known to man. With this extremely high altitude and this hardship, however, came some good benefits. Because of the massive change in elevation, you could encounter a huge diversity of different ecological zones, meaning you could plant a bunch of different crops at different levels. If there was a disease or a famine from uh, climate change, you could just replant in a different zone as they weren't all the same. The Inca were the final great society to emerge from the early farmers. The tiny kingdom of Cusco would rapidly form into Tawantinsu, or what we would call the Inca Empire. So the question is, where exactly did the Inca come from? Well, let's look at the Inca creation story and try to think about the similarities from yesterday. So it began with the great creator god Vir Viracocha, who came upon three different caves. And from the central cave, Viracocha brought forth four brothers and four sisters. And these are the founders of the Inca Empire. One of the side caves came other, and from the side caves came others who would be the founders of the less important clans, the people kind of in uh, the rest of South America. One of the, his brothers, Avar Manco, armed with a magical golden staff, which was capable of testing the fertility of soil. He led his people on an exodus-like journey, at the end of which he was the only surviving member. Upon entering the valley of Cusco, the golden staff sank into the ground, and so his people decided to settle there. The city of Cusco was founded, and this is one of the many origin myths of the Inca, which would be regularly updated and changed for political reasons. For example, if the Inca wanted to integrate a foreign group of people into their empire, then that group would be included into the origin story the next time that it was told. 
However, there is some evidence that this guy, Avar Manko, was probably a real person who led a group of nomads into the valley and actually founded the city in the early 1200s. The first eight kings, uh, Inca kings, have been lost to history, but its ninth king has entered our history. This is known as the Inca Alexander the Great, known as Cuchiapanqui. He rose to power in the early 1400s when he was born in the kingdom of Cusco, and it was just a tiny, tiny, tiny kingdom. It was no larger than the city of Chicago. He was the first in line to rule, but after the kingdom of Cusco was invaded by 40,000 neighboring warriors, his father and brother fled in fear. But it was Cusiapanqui who organized the defense and not only saved the city, but won the crown. Within a single lifetime, all the way from Bolivia to Ecuador, he would grow the empire 20 times in size. He adopted the name Pachacuti, which means earth shaker, or he who turns the world upside down. And he had a very smart system. He would send out spies and messengers to all the kingdoms around them and tell them if they would join together, they would all become richer and more successful. So in order to do this, he, they would have to send their heirs to the capital. So they'd send their next in line to be king to the capital city of Cusco, where he, they would be taught how to be perfect Incas. As they got older, they were then sent back home to rule in agreement with the ruler in Cusco. If they refused, they would be attacked and destroyed by this now hugely large multi-ethnic group of warriors. They would conquer people into their empire, unlike setting up the mostly tributary states like we saw with the Aztecs. By the time Pachacuti's grandson sat on the throne, there was hardly anything else left to conquer. However, many of these great different kingdoms were built into the hard to travel mountains of the Andes, and he needed to figure out a solution for this. Kind of a side note, um, and any people who are into hip hop, uh, Pachacuti's heir was Tupac Amaru. That was the, his name. Uh, Tupac Shakur was named after this ruler who led a revolt against the Spanish in the 1700s. So anyone into hip hop, Tupac is, is named after an Inca uh, king who led a revolt against the Spanish. Kind of cool. All right. So I'm going to show you guys a video about Pachacuti. were the largest empire ever to exist in the Americas. They had rugged, rugged territory through the Andes Mountains, and yet they were able to forge an empire that was notable for the peace and prosperity. The greatest Inca emperor of all was Pachacuti. Pachacuti was really the founder of the Inca Empire in many ways. It was he who had the vision to expand the Inca Empire from beyond the borders of the Cusco Valley and start this campaign of conquest that would take in much of the western half of South America. He was the son of the emperor, but he wasn't the heir. When the Incas were attacked by an outside force of people known as the Chancas, the emperor and his heir fled, leaving the city undefended. It was Pachacuti who stayed behind and, against overwhelming odds, defeated the Chanka warriors. The Chanka were the best organized resistance to the Inca. The Chancas, when they went into battle, they took the mummified body of their ancestor, Usco Vilca, believing that he would aid in their victory. In the Andes, the ancestors are very much present in people's lives. And so important people are mummified. Young Pachacuti knew that if he could portray himself as a living embodiment of the sun and life itself against a people led by a dead mummy, if he could take down the Chanka, his path to increasing the Inca Empire would be unfettered. It was a hand-to-hand -hand 
just all out fight each person for themselves. The goal was to try to capture the mummified body of your friend. He and his men actually captured Uskavilka. They toppled him from his litter. And once they had that, then the Chanka submitted. Those people would have been too terrified to continue fighting once their revered mummified ancestor had been captured. The Inca's victory over the Chancos was legendary. They never stopped talking about it. They never stopped celebrating it. Pachacuti, not only did he defeat the Chancos, but he brought about a transformation of the state. We believe that he brought a greater emphasis on the worship of the sun. He reorganized the religion, he reorganized the bureaucracy, and his name itself, Pachacuni is the name that he took, and it means he who overturns space and time. He changed the course of South American history forever. Pachacuti. So Pachacuti was able to develop and build all these different uh, Tawanitsus, and again, the word Tawanitsu. Um, so ta or tawa means four, neat um, means group, and suyu means regions. And so he had all these different, he was, the power was in Cusco, but what he needed to do was figure out a way to connect all of his four parts of the empire. So what he decided to do was he decided to build a highway that would all come to the center in Cusco, and he would link all of these four suyus so that they would all kind of connect to his cities. So they created a road system in Peru with over 24,000 miles of roads, the second, second longest road ever built in the world was built into the side of cliffs. Pretty crazy. The road, if placed in the old world, would stretch all the way from St. Petersburg in Russia all the way to Cairo in Egypt. They also had uh, a postal system where relay messengers ran across rope bridges to deliver communications to the next team. These uh, messengers lived in pairs, and uh, when one person was sleeping, and the other was on alert for messages. Uh, technically, if you count the Silk Roads, if you count the sea routes as well, but if you just count by land, because that's what we're doing here, then the Inca road system was number two. Pretty crazy to consider how huge and long that was. The longest highway is in Asia today is about 12,000 miles, had about half the distance of the Inca road system. So what we're going to do now is figure out how they built these road systems. So as you guys watch this, I want you to think about um, these Inca road systems that they had. The Inca road system was used not only for transporting goods, but also for communicating information of every kind. Along the Inca roads were post towns approximately every 20 kilometers. Messengers were positioned at these towns. The Incan road messengers were called Chansky. They made it across 280 kilometers in a single day via a relay system. Chaskis could deliver correct information even from communities who spoke different languages by using strings called hiku. The positions, numbers, and colors of knots communicated certain complex meanings, and special tools were used to read the knots. Since they didn't have writing, it was necessary to have Kipu to govern the empire. Kipu made it possible to give exact information, such as population and tax revenues of Incan cities, emergency savings, and amount of livestock. There were special government officials capable of leading Kipu, called Kipu Kamayo. Because of Kipu, Incan emperors could understand events anywhere in the empire and could communicate to anywhere in the empire instantly.
All right, so write down three astonishing things that you guys learned about the Inca uh, system, the road system. All right, so what we're going to talk about now is kind of how they built this giant empire. So because llamas can't plow a field like a horse could, all farming needed to be done by hand. And in order to do this, you need a huge surplus of workers. Unlike in Mesopotamia and Europe, in China, where farms were worked by a single family, in the Inca world, entire communities would work on a farm together, oftentimes on the same field. In times of famine, uh, food and supplies could be sent to those that were in need. The sick people and the elderly uh, who were, who were too um, kind of frail to work the fields were taken care of and the fields were worked for them. And because of the intense environment of this type um, intense environment, this type of farming was necessary to make sure that society began to run smoothly. Because also, uh, because of this, there was a complete lack of markets, which means the entire civilization operated without the use of money. Everything was controlled and operated by the government. Each citizen contributed to these warehouses and needed to purchase nothing. Taxes were not collected in the forms of money or goods, but in the form of labor, known as the Mita system. The government could, have, could then move workers across the empire and focus on the highest priority tasks, such as mining and sewing and construction, which is how they could complete massive projects in their short 100-year reign. Llamas and alpacas were essential to the Inca civilization. Not only could it provide a way to carry the goods, and it could provide meat, but its most important aspect was the llamas could provide cloth. It kept the state functioning. It was everything was this llama cloth. It clothed people, it functioned as a way of social rank, and the best cloth was often given as a gift to those people who pleased the emperor. It was so tightly regulated that the government even issued people their own outfits. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Inca religion. Eventually, the Spanish are going to you before we get there, uh, the Spanish are going to take over the Mita system and use that as a, as a way to enforce culturally to enforce their system of slavery, which was completely different because the Mita system was trying to benefit the Inca Empire. The Spanish are going to use the Mita system to benefit the Spanish Empire. But we'll talk a little bit more about that when that becomes possible. Uh, eventually, they're going to use them to mine silver and these cash crops, and the disease is going to make this entire system kind of crumble on itself, these diseases from the New World. Oh, another llama. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the religion of the Incas. So they believed that the spiritual world and the afterlife were linked. One of the most unusual parts of this empire was mummification. Only members of influential families were regularly mummified and were treated as if they were living. So they were actually fed, they were dressed, they were cared for. And in return, they made sure that the people were uh, cared for, cared for their families. The fields had a steady supply of water. They were consulted in all critical matters and even when in times were tough, were asked what to do. The mummies of rulers were even given an unimaginable level of care and respect. Dead Inca rulers were so well preserved that the Spanish observed people worshipping them long after the empire itself had fallen. Even in death, the nobles still maintained control, which made perfect sense to the Incas who viewed them as still living, contributing to both to the rise and fall of the empire. Because as the wealth of the dead emperor was not passed on, so new emperors could not use that wealth, so they had to come up with new ways of conquest and big construction projects had to begin immediately to control, to secure their control and power. As all the good land fell to the rule of these dead rulers, new emperors had to spend a lot of time far away, which expanded the emperors, very big, but it made stability and control difficult to maintain because they were so far away. With the emperor so far away, new groups would often fight for power so relentlessly and so ruthlessly that the Romans and the kings of Europe would look like school children in comparison. 
These rivalries and hatred went so deep that when the Spanish arrived, they would use the comp these competing families against each other. And so these are some of the ancient Inca gods right here that we have talked about a couple of them. And the biggest one is the llama. Urchkuracuchle, which was the herder of animals, but Viracocha was the, the creator of all. Kind of some different Inca uh, religious figures right here. All right. So uh, as you watch this video, I want you guys to pay close attention. Ooh, close attention to the use um, of mummification and the Inca religion. her to the empire's capital, Cusco. A tunic suggests she was the daughter of a local chief. And cocoa beans place her in an important spiritual circle. But there's one item that stands out above the rest. finest ever found in an extraordinary state of preservation. This headdress is the kind of crown. It is like a princess. For Incas, feathers are more important than gold. For Gabriella, this headdress provides the final piece of the puzzle. This kind of headdress were uh, used only for special ceremonies and mainly for virgins of the sun. Virgins of the sun were famous throughout the Inca Empire. Chronicles record that a special group were chosen each year to serve the sun god. Some could be of a fairly young age. Some could be six to eight years some maybe 10 years, their beauty was one of the reasons for selecting them. And in some cases, even their parents might have offered them to become part of the service of the Inca religion. As a virgin of the sun, the maiden would have been separated from her family, never to return home. Pottery from her tomb suggests she was brought to Cusco. And Johan is here to pick up her trail. This is the place where the uh, Virgins of the Sun were kept, the so-called Akiwas, considered incredibly sacred to the Incas. These buildings were especially designed to keep them apart in order to keep them pure. The maiden lives a cloistered existence, part nun, part priestess, preparing sacred offerings for the sun god. Rarely is she allowed out. So why does she leave this place to make a 1,000 mile pilgrimage to a distant mountain? At a certain point, these virgins of the sun would be allocated their duty. In essence, their destinies. Some would be selected to be concubines of the Inca nobility. And a few, a very select few, would be selected as offerings, as, as human sacrifice. The maiden didn't go to Mount Iliayaco to make an offering. She was the offering, singled out by her own people for human sacrifice. Different kind of qualities were taken into consideration as to which child would be selected. They had to have some kind of a charisma about them. You wouldn't have a, a child who was easily frightened. For the Inca, being chosen for sacrifice was a great privilege. And in Cusco, the maiden would have been treated as a goddess. She would have gone through very special ceremonies in the presence of the Inca emperor himself and been a very highly honored. She left Cusco in a blaze of glory, and the fame followed her all the way to the volcano. 
But under all the glory, there is a bitter truth. A 14-year-old girl walking 1,000 miles, knowing that she is going to die. All right, so any guesses what this site is right here? This right here is Machu Picchu, at least what it looked like in the site in 1911 when the German, the German Hiram Bingham found it. You could only see one group of buildings and the entire population consisted of six pigs. This Six pigs. Oh, no, it didn't load. Oh, man. It's supposed to be a picture of me. All right. Uh, and this is what it looks like today. This is Machu Picchu today. It's about 8,000 feet above uh, sea level, which is about 2,500 feet above the city of Denver. It was built as a royal retreat. Think of like a palace of Versailles in, in France or, or Trump's Mar-a-Lago. Um, this castle getaway was built as a private getaway for the Emperor Pachacuti. The city was discovered in 1911, but the city was ever never actually lost, as it's kind of famously been known. Um, when Hiram Bingham arrived in uh, Machu Picchu, the citadel, there were actually three farmers living on this site, still farming. Spanish conquistadors ever never actually conquered uh, Machu Picchu, as many thought had would have happened. There's no evidence, including letters or travel diaries, that the Spanish actually ever made it to Machu Picchu. Um, it was abandoned and estimated 100 years after it was constructed, probably around the same time the Spanish began their conquest of the mighty pre-Columbian civilization in the 1530s. There's no evidence that the conquistadors ever attacked it or even reached it. Um, however, for this reason, some have suggested that the residents' desertion occurred because of maybe like a smallpox um, outbreak could have been possible. Uh, Machu Picchu cannot fall. Peru is known for earthquakes and cities have been flattened due to them. However, Machu Picchu still stands. This is because the stones were put together so tightly and without mortar that when an earthquake happens, they wiggle and move, but always fall right back into place. The technique was called ashlar and the stones were cut to fit so tightly that not even a knife can fit between the spaces. A design feature that's not only incredible to look at, but engineered to greatness. So I want you guys, we're gonna watch this video about Machu Picchu, and I want you to think about what does this say about the ingenuity and drive of humankind is building this city.
All right, so thinking about what does that have to do and tell us about the ingenuity of the human spirit right there. All right, so that's going to play very much into the next one that we're going to be talking briefly about, which is going to be the Polynesian migrations, the Polynesian migration. So I, about 10,000 years ago, humans had migrated to most of the habitable lands that could be reached on foot. What remained was the last frontier, the myriad of islands of the Pacific Ocean that required boat technology and navigational methods to be developed and were capable of long range ocean voyaging. The islands of the Eastern Pacific are known as Polynesia from the Greek for many islands. They're set within a triangle formed by New Zealand in the South, Hawaii to the North and the Easter Islands in the East. The Polynesian islands are dotted across the vast eastern Pacific Ocean through very small and separated by thousands of miles. They share similar environments and were settled by people with a common cultural heritage. Collectively, these people are called the Lapita and were ancestors of the Polynesians. They include the Maori. Although archaeologists use the term Lapita because the Lapita were not a homogenous group. They were, however, skilled seafarers who introduced outriggers, double canoes, which made voyagers across the Pacific possible and through the use of their distinctive pottery. These people were exceptional boat builders and sailed across the Pacific by navigating by currents, stars, and cloud formations. They were skilled fishermen and farmers growing fruit, trees, and vegetables, and raising pigs, chicken, and dogs. Islanders were also accomplished craftspeople and worked in wood, fiber, and feathers to create objects of power and beauty. The western Polynesian islands of Fiji and Tonga were settled approximately 3,000 years ago, while New Zealand was settledly, settled as recently as 800 years ago. So we're going to take a look at these Polynesians right here. So as we watch this video, I want you guys to check out the methods and ways of travel while watching this scene from Moana.
All right, so that pretty awesome scene. And I got to be honest, uh, Disney, I'm really impressed. Uh, the episode, the clip yesterday from The Road to El Dorado was made in 2000, showing the uh, the Spaniards, the Europeaners, at this, as the saviors um, in, in the game yesterday. But today, even 20 years later, very accurate um, in terms of showing those actual Polynesian migrations. So uh, props to Disney for, for really kind of stepping up their history game. All right. So uh, as we watch this video on the Polynesian migrations, I want you to figure out how they actually were able to migrate and navigate this, this vast ocean without any of the technology that we have today. Imagine setting sail from Hawaii in a canoe. Your target is a small island thousands of kilometers away in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's a body of water that covers more than 160 million square kilometers, greater than all the land masses on Earth combined. For thousands of years, Polynesian navigators managed voyages like this without the help of modern navigational aids. Ancient Polynesians used the sun, moon, stars, planets, ocean currents, and clouds as guides that allowed them to see the ocean as a series of pathways rather than an obstacle. Their voyages began around 1500 BC, when the people who would settle Polynesia first set sail from Southeast Asia. Early Polynesians eventually settled a vast area of islands spread over 40 million square kilometers of the Pacific Ocean. Some historians believe the voyagers moved from place to place to avoid overpopulation, others that they were driven by war. Voyages became less frequent by around 1300 AD, as Polynesian societies became more rooted in specific locations. During the voyaging period, successful journeys depended on a number of factors. Well-built canoes, the skill of navigators, and weather being some of the biggest. Voyages relied on sturdy va'akalua, or double-hulled canoes, which were powered by sails and steered with a single large oar. Canoe building involved the whole community, bringing together the navigators, canoe builders, priests, chanters, and hula dancers. Navigators were keen observers of the natural world. They were abundantly familiar with trade wind generated ocean swells, which typically flow northeast or southeast. By day, navigators could identify direction by the rocking motion of their canoes caused by these swells. But sunrise and sunset were even more useful. The sun's position indicated east and west and created low light on the ocean that made it possible to see swells directly. At night, navigators used something called a star compass, which wasn't a physical object, but rather a sort of mental map. They memorized the rising and setting points of stars and constellations at different times of the year. They used those to divide the sky into four quadrants, subdivided into 32 houses, with the canoe in the middle. So, for example, when they saw the star Pira Atea rising from the ocean, they knew that to be northeast. They had some other tricks, too. The Earth's axis points towards Hokupa'a, or the North Star, so-called because it's the one fixed point in the sky as the Earth rotates, and always indicates north. However, it's not visible south of the equator, so navigators there could use a constellation called Nepe, or the Southern Cross, and some mental tricks to estimate where south is. For instance, draw a line through these two stars, extend it 4.5 times, and draw another line from there to the horizon. That's south. But the sky also contains navigational aids much closer to Earth, the clouds, Besides being useful weather cues, under the right conditions, they can indicate land masses. For instance, the lagoons of Pacific atolls can actually be seen reflected on the underside of clouds, if you know what to look for. And high masses of clouds can indicate mountainous islands. Once navigators neared their destination, other clues such as the flight patterns of birds, floating debris or vegetation, and types of fish in the area helped determine the proximity of land. For example, the Manuoku had a known flight range of 190 kilometers and could be followed back to shore. So how do we know all of this? 
partially through evidence in petroglyphs, written observations of European explorers, and Polynesian oral traditions, but also by trying them out for ourselves. In 2017, a voyaging canoe called Hokulea completed a worldwide voyage using only these techniques. If that seems remarkable, remember the ancient Polynesians, who through close study and kinship with nature were able to forge these paths across an unfathomably vast, vibrant, living ocean. The educator behind this lesson helped TED-Ed's student vo- all right, so we're going to talk about that uh, voyage right here, Hokulea, because the Polynesians, they, at the end of the day, they really were the astronauts of the ancient worlds. They discovered unknown worlds with very little technology that we have today. So there are some who are still trying to revive this past. So Hokulea, or, or we, it's known as the Star of Gladness, began as a dream of reviving the legacy of exploration and courage and ingenuity that brought the first Polynesians to the archipelago of Hawaii. The canoes that brought the first Hawaiians to their island home had disappeared from the earth. Cultural extinction felt dangerously close to many Hawaiians when this artist, Herb Kane, dreamed of rebuilding a double-hauled sailing canoe similar to the ones that his ancestors had sailed. Though more than 600 years had passed since the last of these canoes had been seen, this dream brought together people of diverse backgrounds and different professions. Since she was first built and launched in the 1970s, Hokuleo continues to bring people together from all walks of life. She is more than a voyaging canoe. She represents the common desire shared by the people of Hawaii and the Pacific and the world to protect our most cherished values and places from disappearing. Crazy story, in 1978, Hokuleo set out for Tahiti, which for a second time, but can, the heavily loaded canoe capsized in the stormy seas off of Molokai. The next day, the crew member, Eddie Akayo, led on a, left on a surfboard to get help. Crew member Kiki Hogu remembers, quote, we were hours away from losing people, hypothermia, exposure, exhaustion, and when he paddled away, I really thought he was going to make it, and we weren't. But the crew was rescued, and Eddie was lost at sea. And after the tragedy, Nanayo Thompson recalls, quote, We could have quit, but Eddie had this dream about finding the islands the way our ancestors did. And if we quit, he wouldn't have his dream fulfilled. He was saying to me, raise Hawaii from the sea. Eddie Yakao is one of the world's most famous Hawaiians. He was a lifeguard who saved over 50 people in the 1960s. Or, sorry, 500 people in the 1960s. He was one of the world's best surfers. So after he died, they named this competition after him called the Eddie, the surfing competition. And it's held by some of the, with some of the biggest waves that Hawaii has. And the first time it was ever held in 1979, all these pro surfers are doubting whether to surf it because they're saying it's too dangerous. These waves are too big. Some are saying yes, some are saying no. And eventually another Hawaiian legendary surfer named Mark Fu says, quote, Eddie would go. And the competition began. This phrase became a trademark in Hawaiian culture and surfing culture. And it means that Eddie would go on to the biggest wave. He would go to save you. He would go in life. And this kind of idea that if you attempt life, you will be remembered and symbolized. And not just the life of Eddie Aku. This isn't just talking about the life of Eddie Aku, but the Polynesian spirit and adventure of exploration. And it, it embodies kind of who they are and what they, what they do. So this is a really, uh, really interesting story right there. So the last thing we're going to look at is the question of how far did the Polynesians actually go? Voyaging capabilities, so it really makes more sense that the Polynesians. 
politicians needed to stop the madcap. Polynesians were able to island hop across the Pacific because they knew what to take with them to survive, like plants and chickens. Chickens they may even introduce to South America. We have a very good case for chickens moving from Polynesia to South America. Well, the discovery of chicken bones from Chile has turned out to be very exciting. When these chicken bones with Polynesian traits were unearthed in South America, they were immediately controversial. While many scientists originally thought chickens were introduced to South America by Spanish explorers in the 1500s, the radiocarbon date of these bones would prove otherwise. They're pre-Columbian. Polynesians made it to South America, probably dropped off chicken while they were there, picked up a sweet potato, and then made the two-way voyage back to Polynesia. Sweet potatoes are not believed to be native to Polynesia, but they are native to South America, a possible clue. The sweet potatoes are these low viney plants, and you can see that they're flowering here. Studies on charred sweet potato remains found in Polynesia suggest the plant was introduced to the islands in pre-Columbian times. Sweet potato is an American plant. It has wild populations in Central and South America. It was domesticated by Native Americans thousands of years ago. We knew that sweet potato had been introduced from somewhere else. The linguistic name for sweet potato, kula, is not a Polynesian word. As linguists had looked for a long time to find out where the word kula came from, and it's actually been linked to an Ecuadorian tribe that are intensive sweet potato producers. It is absolutely certain that we have pre-Columbian sweet potato, pre-European sweet potato in Polynesia, and that it was transferred by people, not by floating or by birds, because you don't get the word traveling with the potato if it's not face-to-face -face transfer of the sweet potato. Pretty interesting. So this goes back to about 1000 CE, if this theory is true. Um, and it could be the reason um, that uh, we have things like crops, such as sweet potatoes, bananas, coconuts, pigs, dogs, chickens, all across the Pacific was because of the Polynesians. So you know what? Eat your heart out, Christopher Columbus, because you were not the one uh, to discover the Americas. The Polynesians were over almost 500 years before you. Um, and none of this evidence actually points to this all being accidental. Instead, it was because of the human curiosity to explore. And it's thanks to the Polynesians that that happened right there. All right. Um, the last thing I'm going to show you guys before we um, kind of leave for class today is I want to do the last um, couple questions, the too long uh, didn't read ones right there, the too long didn't read um, ones that are on there. And let me just add those to the slide so that you guys can see them. One's there, and then there's one more right here. I don't, oh, also, I, I do have to point this out. Very disappointed how perfect my slide was right here with the pigs, the six pigs. And then look at that. This is what it looks like today. It was a little cloudier that day. But anyways, um, one more that we're going to look at is the too long, didn't read version of what was going on at this time. So the natives in this period of 1200 to 1400 exist all by themselves. So we're going to forget about any Spanish or colonial stuff here. So no Spanish stuff. This is all the natives and just how they lived before the Europeans came in contact. Number two, there are a ton of different societies in the Americas before the Spanish arrived. Um, but the ones that we're going to focus on are the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Incas. The AP does want you to know about the Pueblo builders and Cahokia um, as well. So I think that was in the reading that you guys had. So just kind of be aware of those um, kind of in, in North America that were, was going on. Um, the Pueblos built those dwellings in the desert of like Texas and Arizona. And Cahokia was the one that was built on the Mississippi um, mountain right there. Number three. Um, and arguably the most impressive city in the Americas is Tenochtitlan. Today, it's actually built underneath Mexico City with its floating gardens that we call the Chinapas. And then number four, um, writing is pretty hard to come by, but the Incas have these talking knots, these quipu, and the Mayans have their own written script, but there are others that have yet to been figured out. And last but not least, the largest migrations of all time were done in this area in the ocean 
of the South Pacific by the Polynesians. Their sea expedition made it all the way to the Americas from Hawaii and Polynesia. So that's kind of what's going on in this section 1.4 in a nutshell. All right, that's going to finish up. Make sure you guys finish up your notes for this section, and I will catch you guys next time on the next tale of world history.